Well, it was about a year ago that we began a series on a once a month basis called Watch, Pray, and Be Ready, in which we, throughout 2022, would return on a monthly basis to Matthew chapter 24 and the complementary passages that we find in Mark and Luke of Jesus's unfolding of the future. And as I thought about 2023, some things have changed, but other things have not. So at least as of today, and most likely February and March, we will continue to devote the first Sabbath of the month in 2023 to watch, pray, and be ready. In 2023, as we focus on this from month to month, it may not be quite as tightly tied to Matthew 24, but we'll certainly look at current events through the larger scope of Bible prophecy. And today, think with me of what we will soon see to be the Apostles' confession and desire that Christ will be magnified. Philippians chapter 1 is our scriptural foundation today. It's around verses 17 and 18 in that area. If you would like to turn to your own copy in your lap, all the scriptures will be on the screen as well. Paul writes to the believers in Philippi, <clears throat> For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress of joy and faith. Let it sink in. The apostles' earnest expectation and hope is that Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Now, some of you are aware of this. Others may not. The letter to the Philippians is one of those documents of the New Testament that Paul wrote while he was in prison. <clears throat> References made to this a little bit earlier in that same chapter, verses 12 and following. He writes about the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to all in this whole place, even the palace guard, and to all the rest, that my chains are in Christ. Paul writes about being chained. And he makes another reference to his chains in just a few verses following in verse 16. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. He echoes for us once again. Through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Deliverance is going to come to me one way or the other, writes Paul. It's going to come through my release from prison. Or it might come to me through release in death. But either way, 
I will be supported. I will be released through prayer and the Spirit of Jesus. Now, there's a tension in these verses if you spend some time with them. There's a tension between being freed from prison, which the apostle believes is likely to happen. He's not guaranteed that this will happen. But as you read what he pins, he feels that it is likely that he's going to be freed from prison. Or, the other option, he will be freed through death and be with Christ. Which, he says, if I had a choice on my own, I would opt for that. He had that much confidence in his experience with Jesus. Now, what we're going to do for the next two or three minutes is not the main portion, the priority of the message today. But because of this phrase, I would desire to be freed and depart and be with Christ, I have to spend just a few moments here unpacking this in the light of other passages in the New Testament. Because, as we know, many of our friends in other Christian faith communities look at this text and they conclude that upon the point of death, one immediately goes into the spiritual presence of Christ. You are aware of that many people believe that. Is that correct? Yes. And if you had this passage only, you could come to that conclusion if you had this passage only. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, writes the apostle. Does this imply that there is a conscious transition from life on earth as we know it to an heavenly realm shortly following death? It would seem to say so on the surface. The key phrase is to be with Christ. How does this phrase show up in other areas of the apostles' writings in the New Testament? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, a passage of Scripture that we as Adventists are very, very familiar with. Starting around verse 13, the apostle writes this to the Thessalonians. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. The apostle is referring to Jesus' resurrection. Jesus died, but he rose again. The apostle assures us that just as Jesus was raised from the dead, God will bring those who sleep to an experience of resurrection. We continue on in this same chapter. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Two times here already. The apostle has used that word sleep, referring to death. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, And with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together and with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always, what? Fill in the blank. We shall always, what? Be with the Lord. What did the apostles say in Philippians? It'd be far better to depart and be with Christ Do you see the similarity of the phrases here? So, are you with Christ at the moment of your death on this earth? Or are you with the Lord at the resurrection? You can't have it both ways. It's either one or the other. If we only had Philippians 1.23, we could reach the conclusion... That at the point of death as we know it on this earth, there's there's an instantaneous transition to some type of a conscious state in a heavenly realm where we are with Christ. But if we compare that with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it is at the resurrection that we are with the Lord. Do you see? 
One other passage that is relevant to this, to bring clarity to it and underscore it and affirm it, is 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is writing now with a greater sense of clarity about the end of his earthly life. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, he writes, The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now, question. <clears throat> if, if, at the point of one's physical death here on this earth, that one went immediately into some type of a spiritual presence in being with Christ, why would you have to wait X number of years, decades, centuries, millenniums to get your crown? Because the apostle says right here, the crown will not be given until the day of the Lord with the appearing of Jesus Christ. So I think that helps to resolve some of the tension that we find in the general Christian community. The apostle would be delivered in the sleep of death if he would experience martyrdom in reference to his Philippian comment. Now, there's one other passage that we need to look at briefly. Again, this is not the main point of the message. This is just a little bit of scriptural explanation because we know what is out in the general Christian community as a rather common belief. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. This has a similar feel to it as Philippians chapter 1 and verse 23. If we are absent from the body, we are present with the Lord. If we take this in isolation, one could come to the conclusion that there is a conscious existence upon the point of death in a heavenly realm because we are with the Lord. But in this same chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you back up two or three verses and catch the context, there is a clarifying, confirming uh, comment about what it means in relationship to being absent from the body and with the Lord. Notice what we find, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now the apostle is using somewhat of figurative language here to refer to the physical body. He refers to it as <clears throat> a tent and a building. In an earthly realm, he speaks of it as being a tent. But in a heavenly realm, it's more than a tent. It's a building. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. In essence, he's saying, I'm looking forward to my heavenly body, a physical body. If indeed, he continues on, I think, for some reason, there we go. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. Interesting little phrase here that the apostle uses. What the apostle Paul does not want, he doesn't want to be without a body. I need a body here, and I need a body in heaven. And I don't want to be without a body. I don't want to be some type of a disembodied spirit. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed. I'm sorry. Yes, not because we want to be unclothed, but we want to be further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. The apostle is looking forward to an heavenly body. And of course, this harmonizes very beautifully from another passage of Scripture in the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15. We're familiar with these words as well. 
we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. We as human beings are designed to always have a body. A body in this realm we call earthly life and a body in the heavenly realm which will be incorruptible and immortal. So we come back to that tension there. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul is saying, I'm going to be delivered one way or the other. I'm going to be freed from prison. It's likely, I don't know for sure, but it's likely because I believe that God has ministry for me to perform on your behalf or I will be delivered through the sleep of death and at the resurrection I will be with Christ. He said, I'm actually looking forward to that. We've noted that Paul is writing this from prison and it is fascinating to learn that of all the times that Paul writes, all of his letters, Joy is a dominant theme in this particular letter more so than the other letters that he wrote. 29 times that word for rejoice is used in all of Paul's writings in the New Testament. Nine of them, approximately one-third of them, appear in his letter to the Philippians. Paul is joyful because Christ is being preached, even in prison. Paul is joyful because there's a fellowship of suffering that he is experiencing on behalf of Christ. Paul is joyful because of a commitment in faith that he is experiencing. And he is joyful because of a sense of belonging to Christ. You can see those bullet points that come on one after the other. And this is just a sample of what we find in Paul's letter to the Philippians. So, sitting in prison... With an uncertain future, I don't know if I'm going to be released or maybe I will experience martyrdom and I will be sleeping peacefully in Jesus. Either way is okay with me, so writes the apostle. And he rejoices in the certain purpose, his purpose, earnest expectation that Christ will be magnified in my body whether through life or through death. So how about us here at the beginning of 2023? Do we have that same kind of certainty? Is that our earnest expectation as we consider the uncertainty of this new year? You all have likely heard of the tragedy that took place with DeMar Hamlin, safety for the Buffalo Bills, at the age of 24, experiencing a heart attack in the first quarter of the game. This has been all over the news this week. I can almost guarantee you that when DeMar Hamlin suited up for that game, the idea of him having a heart attack was not anywhere in his orbit, even at the outer reaches of his mental, emotional galaxy, that he would have a heart attack was not present in his consciousness. But he had one. Uh airport worker in Montgomery, Alabama just this last week a ground crew worker got a little bit too close to a parked plane the engine of which was running and was sucked into that engine plane was ingested into the engine 
We can know for certain when that individual left for work that morning, he or she had no idea that they were going to cross over that line on what is called the safety apron or the safety circle. And, and who knows how it happened? No idea that they would not be returning home that night. Closer to home, in Charlotte, here. Three men went to work, fully intending to return home. But they didn't, due to the scaffolding collapse that took place in uptown Charlotte this week. Another letter that we find in the New Testament asks us this question. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. Now, we can make plans, and we should make plans. But the Bible tells us that it is the Lord who determines our steps. Proverbs 16, 9. Whether we will be returning home that night or not. So, what's on the horizon for 2023? What do you think we might experience individually, as a family, a church family, as the human family in 2023? I'm not a prophet. I don't have the gift of prophecy, but I do observe. And here's what I think we will be experiencing in 2023 as a human family. We will continue to experience conversation that takes place internationally as well as domestically about the climate crisis. It is going to be an ongoing issue. We will continue to experience international conflict and war, hopefully, Hopefully, the war between Russia and Ukraine will come to an end. It's not guaranteed. Will China invade Taiwan? We don't know. Maybe they will. Maybe they will not. But we know this. International tensions will continue to be a player for the human family in 2023. There will continue to be economic and financial stress. Our paper money will continue to lose its value. We will be continuing to shift towards digital currency and control. Is there another health crisis looming on the horizon? Will there be another pandemic? For us in this country, the COVID issue is largely in the rearview mirror. We cannot say that it is over. It is not over but it has certainly shifted from pandemic status to endemic status for us in this country. Evidently, that is not the case for many in China. I find it interesting that actually the COVID-19 pandemic was seemingly predicted. In 2017... The director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, we all know his name, stated that there would be a, a surprise outbreak. There would be a pandemic that would occur within the current president's term. Maybe some of you are aware of this. Well, you know, you can't believe everything that pops up on the Internet. There is a website that claims to be a credible fact checker. Snopes.com, I checked it, and actually they said that this claim is authentic. That the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases did state in 2017 that there would be a surprise outbreak occurring in the president's term at that four-year cycle. How did he know that? How did he know that? Was it just a general prediction? Or did he know something that almost everybody did not know at that time? 
In August of 20, I'm sorry, I got my dates there just a little bit confused. <clears throat> I should read there, in August of 2019, in August of 2019, an event was announced that would be taking place later in the fall in October of 2019. The event was called 201, Event 201, identified as a crucial tool to understand not only what is needed to effectively respond to global pa public health crises, but also the consequences of what happens when we are not prepared. So in August of 2019, the Center for <clears throat> Health Security, in association with Johns Hopkins University, announced an event to occur, Event 201, that would be taking place later in the fall in October of the same year. This is what we read when we look at their website. The Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, in partnership with the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, will host a global, a global pandemic exercise called Event 201 on Friday, October 18, 2019. This will take place in New York City. The exercise will illustrate the pandemic preparedness efforts response decisions and cooperation required from global businesses, governments, and public health leaders that the world will need to diminish the large-scale economic and societal consequences of a severe pandemic. So an announcement is given approximately three months in advance. We're going to have this exercise. This is going to be a run-through. This is going to be a trial. And then, of course, we all know what happened in January, February, and March of the following year. March 2020 has been identified by some as the month that COVID-19 changed the world. And I agree, it did. It changed the world. A professor of Hebrew at Hebrew University, Yuhari, Yuval Harari, has made this statement. People could look back in 100 years and identify the coronavirus epidemic as the moment when a new regime of surveillance took over. It's been many months since I, since I made a statement like this, but I'll revisit it. The whole COVID-19 phenomena was horrible. The, the health devastation was real, but in many aspects, it was an experiment in controlling our society. Now, if we think about what had been announced and then what had taken place, is there anything else on the horizon by way of a possible, probable future pandemic? And the answer is, yes, there is. Just this past year, October 23, 2022, there was an event that took place in Brussels, Belgium, known as Catastrophic Contagion. Again, the same organizations largely are involved. The Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, in partnership with the WHO, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation conducted a catastrophic contagion, a pandemic tabletop exercise at the Grand Challenges annual meeting in Brussels, Belgium on October 23, 2022. It seems as though October is a favorite month to be making announcements. <laughs> the extraordinary group of participants consisted of 10 current and former health ministers and senior public health officials from Senegal, Rwanda, Nigeria, Angola, Liberia, Singapore, India, Germany, as well as Bill Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's interesting that most of those nations represented or identified there are from the African continent. 
I'm taking this right off their website. I'm not making this up, just taking it off their website. The exercise simulated a series of WHO emergency health advisory board meetings addressing a fictional pandemic set in the near future. Okay, it's fictional right now, but we're, we're going to talk about it, and it's set in the near future. Participants grappled with how to respond to an epidemic located in one part of the world that then spread rapidly, becoming a pandemic with a higher fatality rate than COVID-19, and, get this, disproportionately affecting children and young people. So COVID-19 was devastating to the elderly, not the elderly only, but largely as an age demographic, devastating to the elderly. But this future pandemic being described here disproportionately affects children and young people. Set in the near future, a higher fatality rate than COVID-19, disproportionately affecting children and young people. Is this actually going to happen? I don't know. But evidently, those who are in the know are talking about it, right? So what's going to happen in 2023? There'll continue to be conversations about climate crisis. There'll continue to be international conflict. There will continue to be economic stress, inflation. And likely, maybe it won't happen in 2023, but it'll be on the horizon, a pandemic in the future. That's why throughout this year as well, we're going to continue to watch, pray, and be ready. And through the lens of the apostles' experience, that Christ may be magnified whatever happens in the culture. Whatever happens domestically and internationally, we want to be positioning ourselves in such a way that Christ will be magnified. Whether we lay down our lives due to one cause or another, or if we continue to press on day after day, week after week, and month after month. Now, as we look at the Apostle's statement here in his letter to the Philippians, <clears throat> we catch insights as to how Christ is magnified in our lives as we look at his personal experience. So we're going to take one statement from each of the four chapters and just dwell on those just briefly to see how Christ is magnified in his life. The first one is this. Do not be surprised with suffering. Whatever form it comes in, do not be surprised at suffering. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 and following, we're not going to look at all these verses. I've kind of highlighted some of the most salient comments. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, writes Paul, not in any way terrified by your adversaries. Now, adversaries for him were people who were in his face opposing the gospel of Jesus. That may be the case for us. It may not be the case for us. We may have adversaries on another level. But the apostle writes, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now hear in me. Almost sounds like suffering is some type of a gift. It has been granted to you that you suffer. I don't know if I really want that gift. But in one form or another, we get it. We get the gift. And the experience of suffering that we go through deepens us and broadens us if we allow it to, if we relate to it in the right manner. 
it brings maturity into our experience as followers of Jesus. Do not be surprised with suffering. That's the first how. The second one is embrace the mind of Christ. Embrace the mind of Christ. Taken from the second chapter, we read this. This is around verse 4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of of a cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Each line is significant and worthy of reflection. But just as an encapsulating, overarching takeaway, the mind of Christ is this, humility before glory. Humility before glory. And glory is seen in the mind of Christ, specifically Christ personally, as the glory of self-sacrificing love. Desire of Ages, speaking of the big plan of redemption, speaking of the big plan of salvation and restoration, makes these comments. Both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. In the light from Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven, that the love which seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God. By love's self-sacrifice, the inhabitants of earth and heaven are bound to their creator in bonds of indissoluble union. What a rich phrase. Our hearts are bound in an indissoluble, you cannot destroy this union because our hearts have been captivated by the self-sacrificing love of God in Jesus upon the cross. How will Christ be magnified in our life? How was Christ magnified in Paul's life? Through his suffering, through embracing the mind of Christ, and thirdly, by nurturing a passion to intimately know Jesus. Philippians chapter 3. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. This is a little bit of speculation. Paul was a Pharisee, and if I remember correctly, Pharisees were married. There was a requirement to be a Pharisee. Because of his conversion to Jesus, Paul likely lost his marriage. For those who are in a marriage which is spiritually not on the same page, to take comfort in that is not exactly the right word. But you can be assured that there are others who have gone before you and have experienced a spiritually divided marriage where one has great convictions 
and the other one does not. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that Paul writes that if you have an unbelieving spouse and does not want to be with you anymore, let him go, let her go. And reading between the lines, I think that's exactly what Paul experienced. He let go of his marriage, not because he wanted to, but because his spouse did not want to stay with him. Suffered the loss of all things. Paul was an outstanding Pharisee. You can read about it in this same chapter. His heritage, his culture, his education, his career as a Pharisee. All came to an end on the outskirts of Damascus when God shone that light upon him. And then later instructed Ananias to tell him, you are going to suffer for this man, this God who has blinded you temporarily. Paul may have even lost all of his eyesight. This, again, is somewhat speculation based upon other things that he writes to other church groups in the New Testament. But he had a difficult time with his vision, and some scholars believe that that difficulty with his vision was a residual effect of the light that shone upon him on the Damascus road. I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. I have suffered the loss of all things that I might gain Christ. And then he goes on to say that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Now, Paul had already come a long way by the time he writes this letter, but then he, he confesses, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Paul was not one to simply rest on his past experience. He was always stepping forward, always being initiative, always saying, yes, I have, but I want more. So as we think about where we are at in our experience with Jesus, where are we on the intimacy level with Jesus? If, if, if zero is no intimacy at all, I mean, you, you pray at meals and that's about it. And 10 is highly intimate. There's secluded, private, quiet experiences with the Bible with prayer, with your prayer journal, practicing the presence of God throughout the day, where are we on that scale? Christ is magnified in our lives as we value the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. Fourthly, rest be confident in the sovereign care of God. Taken from chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding. What a combination of words. The peace of God, which surpasses understanding. I don't know how this works intellectually, but spiritually there's a dynamic going on. I can't explain it, but I experience it. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Oh, it was the apostles' earnest desire and expectation that Christ will be magnified in my life. I'm not going to be surprised at suffering. I'm going to be intentional about embracing the mind of Christ. Humility before recognition. Humility before glory. Nurturing a passionate relational experience with Jesus and resting, being confident in the sovereign care of our God for us. So, 
what's going to happen in 2023. Only as we live week to week and month to month will we find out. But we know this, that our world largely is infested, affused, afflicted with all sorts of dynamics, movements that are antithetical, anti-God. And these will continue. They will continue. But one day, Jesus will make everything new. One day, all the former things will pass away. There will be no more fears, no more tears. One day, 